As author Timothy Egan wrote, the secret of life in the Northwest runs in packs of silver. In the Northwest, a river without salmon is a body without a soul. You have spent, and your newspapers have spent, a lot of time, a lot of thought, a lot of effort, a lot of money on covering this issue of salmon that is the center of this story. Why is that important to both of you? So for me, it's definitely a story about who we are in the Northwest, and especially these days, it's a story about who are we going to be. Are we going to be different? Or are we going to be a culture, a geography, a place? that defines itself through not only humans, but the non-human world, the living world that is this beautiful, special place, the Pacific Northwest. The salmon describe that geography. This great place that we all share, we sometimes forget how we're all connected, and we're all connected by that water, and in that water are these fish. My gosh, these fish are going away. And what's going on here? What are we doing? Why are we not doing something about this? This whole discussion in the Colombian snake, we wouldn't really even be having it. It was individual tribal fishermen who went out and exercised their rights in the 70s and 80s, getting arrested. <laughs> Billy Franks up here in the Puget Sound. These guys went out and they fished when nobody wanted it. They forced the rest of us to look to the river. They forced the rest of us to quit taking our rivers and our salmon for granted. The issue of restoring salmon runs to what historically and prehistorically were the case brings up the question, can we get them at least in a direction back there? And that led to the issue of removing dams. This is not just theoretical, it's been done. To stand in what was a reservoir just five years later, there are trees growing over my head. This place that you didn't hear eagles, you didn't see kingfishers in the lower river. Today, people who've lived in the Elwha Valley for a long time will tell you they have never seen so many eagles in the lower river. Why is that? They're there because the Yulikon are back. They're there because the forage fish are back. So it is spectacular, and if you haven't been out there, uh, you must go. You live in the backyard of the world's largest dam removal project, and it is working. We in our lifetime will never see the full thing, of course, but the fish are coming back, the birds are booming, even the little mice are getting in on the act. They're starting to colonize those big fat stacks of wood that now get to migrate down the river and rebuild the channel like it was always supposed to. And all that sediment that was stuck behind the dams I invite you to Washington's newest beach. <laughs> it's at the mouth of the Elwha River. Those four dams are important for short-term peaking when we need a lot of power in the region. They're run-of-the-river dams. They don't have a reservoir behind them, so they can only run for about two to maybe 16 hours as batteries. They aren't very good batteries. The river itself no longer produces goods and services as much as it did 20 years ago, and the power is not worth as much money, and Bonneville has this imperative to go through a transition of which its hydro dams are only a part of, and a much smaller part of, and these have always been the four dams that were the least valuable to them. We've had the last almost 20 years of on and off, but pretty darn good ocean conditions. Now the ocean's turned, and we're facing some really dire situation. Even in that great habitat, uh, four-star uh, hotel of habitat we have. And so it's, you know, we don't have a lot of time anymore. When I think of an animal that is the face of what we're talking about tonight, it's actually that animal, because, I mean, here you have this really rather sad situation of a critically endangered animal, the southern resident orca whale, down to only 76 animals. This is a JKNL pod, and, and they are absolutely genetically unique, and they're also culturally unique. In their families, which are matriarchal, Chinook salmon are what they eat. It's what they prefer. They will eat other fish. They'll take a coho, even a lingcod, now and then, but mostly, it's Chinook salmon that they want. And 
the sad thing that we're watching is that they are starving. They cannot get enough to eat. Why is that? Well, that's because in all of the waters that they travel to eat, whether they're in the Puget Sound or they're at the outer coast or in the Straits, the salmon they need are a threatened species. So you have this perfect tableau of an endangered animal depending on a threatened animal for its main food. If we think about where we're at now, there's the orca whale. To me, it is a symbol of the problem. And we are in a time of climate change. All of the margin that we had in terms of the conditions in these rivers is slipping away. You look at those temperatures in the reservoirs these last couple of summers, they're hitting 70 degrees. Salmon are cold water animals. You also have to remember as we talk about, well, Congress is gonna make the decision. Actually, we still have three branches of government and this issue is squarely in the judiciary. For the fifth time, the biological opinion under which these rivers are run by the federal family has been drop kicked by a federal judge and they've been told to do it over. And so here we go again, but it's different this time and it's different for two reasons. They've been instructed at the agencies to re-rack a new EIS, new science, fresh look, everything on the table. That includes two things, dam removal and climate change. We're in this process, it's gonna go on for several years and that's where you come in because it is a public process and it's absolutely your job to know where this is in the courts and uh, to stay involved. These aren't Idaho's fish, these are all of our fish. This is the region's fish. Our steelhead go all the way to Asia. They touch people's lives all over and we need to have the ecosystems in which they depend, ecosystems that are linked all the way to Asia, protected, linked, and resilient, so that they can stand what's coming with climate change. We need resilient ecology. Bonneville, you know, set up by Roosevelt to make our region grow, has succeeded wonderfully up to now, but it's gonna have to completely transform if it's going to survive the next 10 to 15 years. So we all are gonna to have to work together to protect the things we value in this region. We need our leaders to do that. We need to demand it, get ourselves through this transition, the climatic tra transition and you know the economic transition. You could count fish and they don't lie. <laughs> there are more of them or there aren't. They're here or they aren't. Nature is speaking loud and clear, and what we need to do is listen. I don't worry about nature, nature's gonna talk. What I wonder is if we will hear her testimony.